If you have your Bibles this morning, you'll turn with me to the book of Jonah. We're going to look at Jonah chapter 2 this morning. And we'll, we'll go back and start in, in, in chapter 1 uh, and read a couple verses there. Jonah, if you're not familiar with what Jonah is, you go to the break between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And you go back about uh, six or seven books. We're going to look at Jonah this morning. But as we're doing that, I want to do something just a little bit different this morning. Uh, because this is the week, uh, the Sunday before Thanksgiving, I want to give each of you the opportunity to share something that you are thankful for. But here's the twist. You have to do it in five words or less. So, is there anyone that would like to share something that you are thankful for, uh, but in five words or less? I'm not going to call on you. I'm just going to let you. No, just, salvation. Salvation? Yeah. Family. Family. Friend of Lucas. Yes. Congratulations. If uh, you're not friends with um, Alexis and now Robert on Facebook, who joined the 21st century. This week. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. Did he get a prize for being the 100th? Right um, they have a new grandbaby that is a miracle and uh, just as cute as can be. Lucas, right? Uh, someone of Virginia, you have your name? Benign. Amen. Yes. Yeah. I'm happy for this church. I'm making sure that you got that. And I have to take one off. Anyone else? Again. Yes. Yeah. Jesus, my Lord and Savior. Amen. Third. Michael and Melissa Chandler. Yeah. Richard? Save the blood of Jesus. Amen. Yeah. Anybody else? <coughs> Some of you wanted to talk in service before, so here's your chance. <laughs> it's your chance to talk back if you want to. There's no snow here. If you would take a look at Jonah, um, almost all of us know the story of Jonah. In fact, it's probably one of those first stories, if you're a kid, you learn in church. Uh, we all know the story of Jonah um, and how the Lord called Jonah to go and proclaim his good news to the wicked people in the city of Nineveh. And then Jonah was disobedient. He decided that he did not want to go um, to Nineveh. And so he decided he was going to go the opposite direction. And so he boarded a ship and was setting sail to Tarsus, going the opposite way. And so as he sailed that way, uh, there came a great storm. Jonah was thrown overboard because he told them that he was running from the Lord. So uh, the men prayed to God and said, Lord, do not hold this man's life accountable to us. They threw him overboard. The Lord sent a great fish to swallow Jonah after Jonah was there in the belly of the whale, or great fish for three days. Um, the Lord caused the whale to spit him back out on the shore, and then Jonah made things right with God in, the, in that time, and then he went and did his duty uh, that God had called him to do, and then he sat next to the tree, and he was bitter about that. And so... That is one of the stories that we learn as a child if you've grown up in church. Or if you've ever been around church very long, you've probably heard the story of Jonah. Uh, but uh, as you grow up and you hear this story, you make this picture in your mind. And one of the things that Satan does to us is he has this ploy to make us think, oh, that's just a story that's in the Bible. It's not something that really happened. But the thing that we have to remember about Jonah's life is this is not just a story. This is something that really happened. Jonah was really swallowed by a great fish or a whale. He really spent that time in the stomach of the fish. And then he was spewed out back onto the beach and went and did what God had asked him to do. This isn't something that's made up. It isn't something that's false. And it is actually something that is not out of the ordinary, things that we haven't seen happen here on the earth before. Because it has happened. Um, in the 1700s, there was a man that toured Europe with a preserved shark that had swallowed him. 
and then spewed him back after a period of time that he didn't know how long. And he had written this account of it uh, there uh, on Discovery Channel or History Channel, one of those channels, in an effort to prove the Bible wrong and in this account of Jonah's life wrong, they actually attempted this. And the guy lived as they took him out of the stomach of this fish. Um, just, I, th I think it was Rodney, someone was telling me this week um, about a guy that this had happened to, where they were reading the account of someone that was swallowed by a great fish or a whale and then was spewed back out and lived to tell what happened. And so this is something that can happen. It's been proven and it did happen in Jonah's life. Again, it's not just a story. And the other thing that we have to remember, if we really believe that we serve an all-powerful God, God could do whatever He wanted to do. And so if God wanted to send a giant hummingbird to swallow all of us up this morning, God could do that. God controls every particle in this earth, every bit of it. He spoke it into existence. And so He has the authority to dictate and direct however He would like. And that gets us here to the story of Jonah. Now this morning we're going to focus on chapter 2, but to give you just a little bit of the background of what happened here, I want you to go back, if you would, to verse 11 of chapter 1. So we'll start reading in Jonah chapter 1, verse 11. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, asked Jonah, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, Jonah replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried to the Lord, O Lord, please don't let us die for taking this man's life. Don't hold us accountable for killing an innocent man for you. You, O Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. So therein lies that story that we all learned in growing up in church, or sitting in a Sunday morning service like this. <laughs> Continue on with me, if you would, in chapter 2. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God. This is Jonah's prayer. He said, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and He answered me. From the depths of the grave, I called for help, and You listened to my cry. You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me, all your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me, seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down, the earth beneath me barred me in forever. But you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer arose to you, your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto the dry land. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you this morning. We give you thanks. We give you thanks because you are our God and we are your people that you died for, that you gave Christ's life on a cruel cross for us. And as Jonah proclaimed it from the belly of a whale, we proclaim it here this morning. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And we thank you for that gift that you have given to us. Lord, I just pray this morning in this service that you would speak to us. I pray this morning that you would minister to each and every one of our hearts and that you would lead us to this song of thanksgiving similar to what Jonah prayed from the belly of the fish. Thank you again, Father, for your blessings. Thank you for your presence this morning and speaking to us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 
From this account, we know that Jonah spent uh, three days and three nights in the belly of a whale or a great fish. And it started off as a very bad week for Jonah. Because as he prayed in this prayer, he said, my life was fleeing from me. I knew that I was dying. And you can almost picture Jonah as he's been tossed overboard from this ship in this great storm. And as he starts to float maybe just a little bit, and then he starts to finally sink down into the sea. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, here comes this great fish that Jonah recognizes that the Lord sent to him. Sometimes these things, these situations, like Jonah had encountered right here, as we have just read, come to us out of the blue. It seems like a storm out of nowhere. And if you look around the crises in our world today, you can see in countries around the world, not just any longer in the Middle East, but all around the globe, countries that are in crisis. There is a constant threat, as we've seen the past couple weeks, of terrorism. And from that, then we get politicians that are arguing and bickering back and forth. And one side says this, and another side says that. And who knows if any of them are even right on what their opinions are of the matter. But you can see in this world that there are lots and lots of troubles. And some of you don't even worry about those types of troubles because you would say in response to that, I have enough troubles of my own. You don't know the troubles that I would face, you might say. You might be thinking of marriages that are in crisis. You might be thinking of people that you love that don't know Jesus as their Savior. You might be thinking of children who have turned and gone a whole different way from the way that they have been taught. You might go over and over and over in all of these crises that you might have in your own life. And you might feel like Jonah here in chapter 2 as he shared his prayer as he is slowly drowning and can't keep his head above water. And you might feel that you are in this very same predicament as Jonah. You just can't keep your head up above water. And these deep-seated problems, these deep-seated situations that we have in our life just won't seem to go away. And so then as we approach this week where everyone is going to be talking about Thanksgiving and what they are thankful for. And you, you'll hear it in church and then you'll hear it at work and you'll hear it with your family and your friends and your neighbors and everywhere you go and you begin to question, is there anything even to be thankful for? I just want to keep my head up above water. But it was in this situation that we read here in Jonah chapter 2 that Jonah said, out of this, I will give you a song of thanksgiving. Out of this situation, I will sacrifice to you, God. And what I have vowed, Jonah said, I will do it because salvation belongs to the Lord. To find a true meaning of thanksgiving. To find truly where God wants us to be, not just on a week or a day of the year. We have to look further at Jonah's life. And the story of Jonah and the whale, or the Jonah and the big fish, that really happened, is not a story that we often turn to to look at for Thanksgiving. But it was in the midst of this storm, in the midst of this drowning, and in the midst of this fish swallowing Jonah, that led Jonah in his rebellious heart to a moment of song, of thanksgiving to God. In one of the worst jams ever in Jonah's life, God led him to thanksgiving. So how do we get to the place of thanksgiving in our own lives? How do we get to a place of thanksgiving in our own families? How do we get to a place of thanksgiving amongst all of the problems that we have where we struggle to keep our head above water? A few things to share with you from the life of Jonah. The first thing Jonah did is he cried out to God because God will hear you. If you are nowhere near a moment of thanksgiving in your life, if you are dealing with crisis after crisis and all of these deep-seated problems and situations in your life, you have to be like Jonah and cry out to God. Because the assurance we get from Jonah and throughout the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation is that when we cry out to God, God will hear us. So wherever you're at, 
If you've already reached a song of thanksgiving, or if you are struggling to keep your head above water the way that Jonah was, or you are even further beyond that, I just want to encourage you this morning that the first thing you need to do in your life, in order to move past the situation, and you might not move out of it, but to look past it, you have to cry out for God. In verse 1 of Jonah, ch Jonah chapter 2 tells us, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord from the fish's belly. And then in verse 2, Jonah looked back on his prayer. And this is what Jonah said. I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly I cried, and you heard my voice. You see, Jonah is telling us that he has drowned. He has been left for dead. The men in the boat were scared to throw him overboard because they were scared that God would hold jo them accountable for Jonah's life. They knew that he was going to die when he, went over, when, he, when he went overboard. But Jonah cried out to God. And in this situation where Jonah should have died and been left to be fish food, he was preserved in the belly of a fish to do God's work. Why? Because he cried out. And those next couple words at the beginning of chapter 2 says, And you answered me. If you don't cry out to God, He's not going to answer you. If you don't reach out to the one that can rescue you from your situation, or that can preserve you through that situation, God will never answer you. The scripture is very clear. You have not because you ask not. And the way that you ask is to cry out to God. Only God could have gotten Jonah out of the belly of that fish. Only God can get you past the situation that you might be in and lead you to a song of thanksgiving. So this morning I challenge you to cry out to God. The second thing that I think Jonah had in the midst of this was Jonah had hope. And he looked to God for his hope. Again, where Jonah was, he was hopeless. There was no hope. He had been left for dead to drown. But still, Jonah looked to God for hope. Verse 3 and 4 says this. As Jonah began his prayer, and he spoke directly to God. He said, you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. I will look again toward your holy temple. Jonah recognized that he was in the predicament that he was in because he had turned from God. Jonah was going the other direction. But here Jonah said, God, I am going to look to you for my hope. I've cried out to you, and now I am looking to you for my hope. Again, Jonah was in one of the darkest places that he had ever been in in his entire life. But he kept looking to God for his hope. So despite what your circumstance might be, despite what your situation might be, despite the hell that you might be going through here on earth, the way that Jonah says he was cast into the pits of hell, despite wherever you're at in life, the one thing that can give you hope is Jesus Christ. Nothing else can bring you eternal hope. It is only God and God alone and the salvation that we have gained through Jesus Christ. And then after that, the fact that our bodies have been made the temple of the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit that dwells in us, that guides us and directs us and clearly gives us the strength to turn back to God for hope. Jonah looked to God for hope and he kept looking to God for hope. So who do you look for hope? Where do you find your source of hope? Is it your spouse? Is it your children? Is it your job, your family, your friends? Where do you find your hope? Jonah looked to God for hope. Had Jonah looked to the other man on the ship, he wouldn't have found any hope. Had Jonah looked to this fish for hope, he would have never found any hope. Jonah found hope, the only place that we can go to for hope, and that is to Jesus Christ, our God and our Savior. 
The big fish situation that you're in, the big fish situation that may be battling you or your family or some others around you, will never give you hope. Now here's a strange way that I began to look at this story this past week. We all know the story of Jonah and the whale. And when we tell this story, we often say, Jonah ran from God. He got on a ship. He was thrown overboard. And God sent a whale. And he was swallowed. And then he was spit out on the shore after three days. We focus a lot on the whale. And we see the whale as a form of punishment for Jonah. That God sent this whale to punish Jonah. But that's not what the scripture tells us. God sent the whale to save Jonah's life. Had it not been for the whale that God used, Jonah would have drowned. The whale wasn't the punishment. The whale was the means by which God preserved Jonah so he could accomplish God's will. The whales in our life, we often see them as punishment. We often say, God, why have you allowed me to be in this whale for three days? God, why have you allowed me to be in this situation? This situation is going to kill me. When God would say to us, I believe oftentimes, no, you are in that situation so that I can preserve you to accomplish my will. That's what happened here with Jonah. The whale was not punishment. The whale was the means by which God saved Jonah. You see, the whale allowed Jonah to have hope. It was not sent to condemn Jonah. You see, the guys threw Jonah overboard so that their lives could be saved. Jonah was thrown overboard so he could drown. They even talked about that. They were even concerned that they would be held accountable for Jonah's life. But this was all a part of God's plan to preserve Jonah, to accomplish God's will. Sometimes the storms that we are in, sometimes the ups and downs of life that we are in, God has led us to those situations so that He can prepare us, so He can use us. And without those situations, without those storms where we think we've been left for dead, we put our hope in so many other things except for Jesus Christ. It was the whale that caused Jonah to look to God for hope. So who do you look for hope? Where do you find your hope? Our hope can be found when we cry out to God and God answers us. But again, how can we get to the place of thanksgiving, the song of thanksgiving, the way that Jonah mentioned here? The third thing I think that we can glean from Jonah and his life is that we have to speak to God about his help. We have to be willing to talk to God and to talk to others about the help that God has given to us. Take a look at verse 5 and verse 6. Jonah says, The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord, my God. And then if you skip down to verse 9, Jonah says this, But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. Jonah was thanking God, speaking to God about the help that God had given him. You see, we have to recognize that our help comes from God. The whales in our life, come from God to rescue us. And here Jonah is recognizing that and speaking directly to God. Later, Jonah would tell others about that, what God had done in his life. I read a story about a fourth grader who had an assignment in her class to write an essay about Thanksgiving. The title of her essay was Thanksgiving in Our Politically Correct World. And this was it, just three short sentences. The pilgrims came here seeking freedom of you know what. When they landed, they gave thanks 
to you know who. Because of them, we can worship each Sunday, you know where, and you also know who. That's sad, but it's so true in the America that we live in today. We're too worried about being politically correct. We're too worried about offending other people when it comes to telling them what God has done in our life. And so, because we don't want to offend anybody, because we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, or because we don't want to hurt their God, we just put a zipper on our mouth and don't talk about what God has done in our life. But the thing that we can learn from Jonah and his life, when God led him out of the situation, the first thing he did is he talked to God about it, and he thanked God about it, and then he told other people. If God has done something for you in your life, and I promise you, He has, then you need to be thanking God for that. You need to tell God, thank you for doing this. Thank you for what you've accomplished. Thank you for the big fish, the whales in my life that have preserved me to do what you have called me to do. The places that you have chosen to send me, I'll now be able to go to because you led me through all of this. You need to thank God for that. But then you need to also do as Jonah did and tell other people about it. We can't take what God has given to us and keep it inside of us. We have a command to tell others. And that is a part of sharing your faith. We can't be politically correct about what God has done in our life. Because if God has given you the greatest gift in the world in salvation, and He has, then we have an obligation to tell other people about that. We can't be silent about what God has done in our life. It is not an option. Because when we remain silent, we are just like Jonah on the ship to Tarsus. So, what has God done in your life? What big fish has God used to preserve you for His work? We have to speak to God and give Him thanks. And then in turn, speak to others about what God has done for us. The last thing, the last thing that I think we can glean from, from Jonah, and this is the one thing that we, we often go to when we talk about the story of Jonah. We talk about how he was swallowed by the fish and he was there for three days and three nights and, and then he spewed back out and then he, he turned. The last thing that I think that we can learn about Jonah that leads us into true thanksgiving is that we have to turn to God in heartfelt obedience. Heartfelt obedience. Now it's important for us to remember that Jonah found himself in the belly of a whale because of his disobedience. Now had Jonah done what God asked, had asked him to do, he would have never found himself in the belly of the whale. But God used that whale to save Jonah and preserve him for his own work, for God's own work. Now, I'm not saying that every crisis in your life, every bad situation in your life is there because of your disobedience. That's a bad theology and we can't build from that because it's a bad foundation and that doctrine will crumble at some point in our lives. The bad in this world is here because of the sin that started in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Now, sometimes our situation results directly from our own disobedience. But sometimes it is just a factor of being in a sin-sick world and not necessarily something that you did directly. Now, Jonah's situation was because of his direct disobedience to the order of command that God had given to him. And you can rest assured, when you disobey God, you will at some point find yourself in one of those big fish moments in your life. And you'll be looking around and wondering, how in the world did I get here? And then you'll be blaming God for the fish instead of thanking God for the fish that saved your life. The way that we get past that and live in a song or a spirit of thanksgiving is to turn back to God in heartfelt obedience throughout every moment of our life. Look at verse 7, 8, and 9.
For when my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, again, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. You see, this is that moment in Jonah's life when he had been running from God. And now he turns back to God in heartfelt obedience, willing to do whatever God had called him to do. He was at this moment dedicating his life to whatever God was asking him to do. And it's that same attitude, that same commitment is the reason why that we celebrate Thanksgiving to this very day. We know that the pilgrims, along with uh, Swanto and the other Indians, celebrated a three-day Thanksgiving feast. That was because God had used that Indian who was taken as a slave. And for ten years, he was transported back to Europe. He came back and saw that his entire village it died because of sickness. And then God used him to minister, who is now a believer in Christ, by the way, to minister to those that arrived. And they celebrated a three-day feast. You fast forward then, and it was George Washington, our first president, who in 1789 gave the proclamation that for the first time on one day, our entire country would celebrate a day of thanksgiving, and the whole country celebrated. And then you get to the 1820s. And it's by this point in our nation's history that Thanksgiving had become almost a thing of the past. There was a few sporadic places here and there around the country that Thanksgiving was being celebrated. But it was more of an ignored holiday than anything else. Kind of like the way that we look at it today. When we go straight from Labor Day to Christmas almost. And we forget about the day of Thanksgiving, a day that our first president declared would be a day that we recognize the Lord for his accomplishments in our own lives. But in the 1820s, there was a lady by the name of Sarah Hale who took up the cause. She was one of the least people to carry on this cause of being thankful in her life. Sarah was a daughter of a dad who had died in the Revolutionary War. But she still took up the cause to be thankful. In 1813, Sarah married David Hale, who died of pneumonia while she was giving birth with their fifth child. Sarah supported her family by making hats, writing poems, and writing novels, and doing anything she could do to support her family but she was still thankful and the theme of Thanksgiving ran throughout all of her writings and she was determined that this moment this song of Thanksgiving if you will the way that Jonah talked about in chapter 2 would not die in our country but that we would be a country that paused to give thanks to God for what he had done in our lives over the years Sarah wrote literally thousands of letters to politicians asking them to make Thanksgiving a national holiday. She eventually went all the way to the top and she wrote President Zachary Taylor and he declined. He refused to do it. She wrote President Spillmore, President Pierce, and President Buchanan and they all refused to take up the cause. But finally, in 1863, this one lady, Sarah Hale, reached President Lincoln with one of her letters. And despite the fact that our country was torn in two by a civil war, President Abraham Lincoln agreed with Sarah, and he agreed to make Thanksgiving a national holiday. It is because of that perseverance that obedience to God of one lady, Sarah Hale, who was persistent year after year after year after year for decades of writing, she finally got through. And that's why we have Thanksgiving as a national holiday in our country today. 
It took her 38 years, but she did it. She was persistent. She was obedient to that voice, God speaking to her in her life. And that is the kind of commitment that each and every one of us need to have to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That commitment of turning back to God in heartfelt obedience, the way that Jonah did here in chapter 2, of saying to God, I'll do whatever, of proclaiming the way that Jonah did in verse 9, of saying salvation belongs to the Lord. It's His gift to give. Jonah pointed us to Jesus Christ. A true heart, a true song of thanksgiving, the way that Jonah writes, points us to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Lincoln, President Lincoln made that proclamation in 1863. And it came at a spiritual turning point in President Lincoln's life. It was during July of that year that one of the worst battles that had ever taken place in the Civil War happened, the Battle of Gettysburg. There were eight to 12,000 men that were killed in that battle. Over 30,000 were wounded and another 10,000 men were still missing. And in that November, the day when we celebrate Thanksgiving, when President Lincoln proclaimed this would be a day that we pause to celebrate and give thanks for what God has done in our life. That day was chosen because that was the day that President Lincoln was walking among the thousands of graves at Gettysburg and he committed his life to Christ while seeing the war-torn bodies in their graves. He later explained to a friend, when I left Springfield to assume the presidency, I asked the people to pray for me. I was not a Christian. When I buried my son, the severest of trial of my life, I was not a Christian. But when I went to Gettysburg and saw the graves of thousands of our soldiers, I then and there consecrated myself to Christ and paused to give thanks for what God had done for me. Salvation belongs to the Lord. So how do we get to this true moment of thanksgiving that we'll celebrate this week? First thing we have to remember is that we have to cry out to God. It worked for Jonah. It works for everyone who has ever cried out to God. Because when you cry out to God, you have the assurance, you have the promise of God that He will answer to you. And then the next thing that Jonah did is he put his hope in God and God alone, no one else. It was God and God alone. And then what did Jonah do? He thanked God for that. He told God, thank you. He paused in the belly of a whale and prayed this prayer to God. And then afterwards, Jonah told others about that. But the thing that sums up everything is Jonah turned to God in heartfelt obedience. And so this morning, I challenge you as we launch into this week of Thanksgiving, if you will, to search yourself, to allow the Holy Spirit to search every bit of your being, to determine if you truly have turned over your life in heartfelt obedience to God. Have you recognized the whale situations in your life? as situations that God is using to make you who you are, to form you, and to preserve you so you can accomplish God's will? Or are you so upset that you are in this whale situation that you can't see anything beyond the walls, the skin of this whale? Because if you're focused on the whale and you're not focused on God, then you still have yet more to turn to God in heartfelt obedience. Because it wasn't until Jonah turned to God in heartfelt obedience that God rescued him. Jonah could have, still could have been left for dead. God could have left him there and he would have died. But instead, because of Jonah's obedience and crying out to God, in Jonah's obedience and finding hope in God and God alone, and in Jonah's obedience 
of thanking God for that and then being willing to tell others for that. It was only when God got Jonah to that moment that God saved his life. And so maybe, just maybe, the whale situations in your life are there because God is waiting for you to turn to Him in heartfelt obedience. Maybe, just maybe, that God has you right where He needs you to be so He can speak to your heart and the rest of the world and Satan's attempts won't block God's voice to getting to you. Do you need to surrender more to God this morning? Do you need to turn more into God in heartfelt obedience this morning? I can't answer that question for each of you. It's a question that you alone have to allow the Holy Spirit to come in and search you and convict you and draw you closer back to God. You can stop it. But you have to be willing to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. As we'll stand and sing in just a moment, our closing song this morning, I ask that as you stand, you invite the Holy Spirit to search you. Inside, outside, top to bottom, and side to side, and every bit of your being to determine if there is something else in your life that you need to surrender to God. Something that you need to give to God and let God champion and conquer that situation. And that will take you to the greatest place of thanksgiving that you've ever been in your entire life. Would you stand with me this morning? Father, we come to you this morning and we give you thanks for what you've done in all of our lives. We pause this morning in the busyness of our own hectic lives and our own hectic situations and this rat race that Satan wants to get us caught in so that we are so busy we don't have time to pause and thank you for what you've done in our lives. But Lord, this morning, I just pray that your Holy Spirit right now would just move across this congregation. That you would speak to every one of us this morning. Every one of us. And we would hear the things that you are saying to us. I just pray and ask God that as you speak to us, we wouldn't be Jonas and initially run away. But we would run to you in heartfelt obedience, finding our hope in you and you alone. Father, this morning we come to you. We surrender everything to you. Asking God that you speak to us, convict us of the things that we need to be convicted of so that we truly can be your people and you can be our God. Because we proclaim as Jonah did, salvation belongs to God. And we thank you for that. This morning, Spirit, move as you desire. Speak as you desire. Lead us to a true song of thanksgiving. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing this morning, let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Let the Holy Spirit give him permission to search you, to try you, to convict you of what we might need to surrender to God this morning in heartfelt obedience to him that would lead to a true song of thanksgiving. Listen and respond to God this morning as we sing.
Now maybe this morning you have some oil situations in your life that you need to pause and give thanks for. For when we read the story of Jonah and the whale, our first instinct is to say the whale was the punishment. But the whale was not the punishment. The whale was the means that God used to save Jonah's life. To get him to this place in Jonah chapter 2, where Jonah turned to God in heartfelt obedience. And so naturally, what we do as humans, we want to curse the whales of our life. We want to look at the whale as a form of punishment instead of the means by which God used to get us right where we're at so that our hearts are ready to turn to Him in heartfelt obedience. Maybe this morning, for you, you need to stop looking at the whales and cursing the whale and saying, the whale is my punishment. And you need to recognize the whale for which God is using in your life to prepare you and make you the spiritual powerhouse that he desires for each of us to be. For without the whale sometimes, we become hard-hearted the way that Jonah was. So this morning, I challenge you. We'll sing one more verse in the chorus. And as we sing that, pause and give thanks for those whale situations, for those big fish situations in our life that God is using to lead us to a song of thanksgiving. Get us to a place of heartfelt obedience to God. As we sing, let's give God thanks for what He deserves. As we sing, let's turn to God not curse those real situations, but give thanks for them today. So that they can proclaim also salvation belongs to the Lord. That they might experience your eternal hope, your salvation for each of us. Thank you, Father, for your presence. Be with us as we go from here. Keep your hand on us and keep us safe, we pray. And bless us as we give you thanks this morning. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 